so Nadia, we're gonna, I think, leave Nadia in her spot right there. Um, probably no one better suited to take us through uh, uh, the discussion. And Nadia has remarkably, she must have a crystal ball in Montreal. She's predicted almost all of the questions that the audience has sent in. Uh, so uh, here is uh, her, what she anticipated would be the practical considerations, starting with first the SGLT2. Nadia, take it away. This is a question uh, for David Fitchett. I am a cardiologist, and you've convinced me after this very comprehensive uh, lectures that we've had. You've convinced me to start treating diabetic type 2 diabetic patients, and I'd like to prescribe an LSGLT2 inhibitor for the first time. So practical rapid-fire questions for Dr. Fitchett. I'm prescribing this patient, a heart failure patient, an SGLT2 inhibitor. When do I need to see this patient in follow-up again? So uh, it very much depends upon the patient's clinical status. If the patient has a good blood pressure, normal renal function, you can send the patient back to the GP and just tell the GP that uh, he needs to be, the patient needs to be seen uh, within a month or two and tell him about the, the risk for uh, uh, genital, genital mycotic infections, uh, and that's all you need to do. Uh, but patients who have borderline blood pressures, blood pressures, for example, systolic blood pressure of 90, you, I think, should bring back. You may need to adjust their medications before you start. But I think those patients, patients who have renal function, uh, glomerular filtration rate, for example, of uh, 40 or 35, you might want to bring back in a month and check their renal function. Okay. So that answers question number two, I guess. So what do I need to monitor? Anything in particular and when? So you're saying we need to monitor the renal function in a month for patients who are, you are prescribing this to who have a reduced GFR. Is that correct? Yes, and, and a low blood pressure as well. And a low blood pressure. So that's what I would need to monitor. Do I need to tell the patient to monitor anything in particular? Particularly, do I need to be worried about hypoglycemia? So hypoglycemia only occurs with SGLT2 inhibitors if the patient is taking a drug which also causes hypoglycemia, and that's sulfonylureas and insulin. If they're not on a sulfonylurea and insulin, the risk of hypoglycemia is almost non-existent. Um, if they are on a sulfonylurea and they have not had hypoglycemia, if their A1C is seven or eight, oh, sorry, sorry, it's eight, eight or so, then the risk is really quite low. If the A1C is around seven or so, then the risk is a little bit higher, but it's still quite low. So I would ask, does this patient have hypoglycemia on their current medications? And if not, uh, warn them that it could possibly happen, but uh, the, the likelihood is quite small. Okay. And um, finally, David, last might, question I for I you. I wonder if yes? we get David to comment mm. on the kidney Oh, sure. And then Sorry. Julie yes, to yes, comment yeah. on the hypoglycemia, yeah. Yeah, just because they would be bringing people back with the kidney. David, what do you Go think? Go ahead. Yeah, so from a, a renal perspective, I, I essentially treat these medicines like, like ACE inhibitors in terms of their renal function changes. And um, I, I generally check kidney function in patients with impaired kidney function at baseline after 10 to 14 days of being on a medication. Mm -hmm. They don't have to come back to see me necessarily. I just send them for electrolytes and a creatinine, mainly to make sure that their creatinine doesn't go up more than an unexpected amount because of the renal hemodynamic changes and volume changes mm -hmm. as well. And, um, and then, the, then the other thing that I, I suggest in terms of monitoring and follow-up is in patients who are uh, euvolemic and normotensive who are on loop diuretics, I tend to half the dose of the loop diuretic if when they start mm -hmm. the SGLT2 and then ask them to monitor their weight. And if their weight is going back up, then just restart the previous dose of the loop. And if not, just to maintain the same lowered dose to avoid volume depletion. So David, the case that David Fitchett presented had yep. a creatinine about 150, was started on furosemide. Yep. You would start canagliflozin, and then what were you looking for the creatinine to happen so in, in four weeks to six weeks? And you're going to drop that sure. furosemide dose from 40 to 20 Correct. right at the first visit? Yep, exactly. And what do you think that creatinine is going to do? It's going to go, so the GFR will go down by around four to six points. So we'll go from, say, its baseline is uh, 50. We'll go from 50 to 45, approximately. That's an expected change. 
If it goes down by more than about 20% on the repeat blood work that you do, then the patient needs to be followed up again to make sure that there isn't a greater than expected change. And if it's more than 20%, then I would either, either back off on the dose or hold it and repeat. All right. Now Just like you would with an ACE inhibitor, right. same, same concept. Now, Julie, about the hypoglycemia, this is your kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this. You know, I actually agree with David uh, Fitchett. Uh, it depends on the patient's uh, baseline A1C. Uh, it also depends to some degree on the patient's GFR because as we heard from David Cherney, the amount of glycemic lowering that you're going to get is really dependent on the patient's GFR. So for patients with uh, reduced renal function, I'm not going to expect as much uh, uh, glycemic lowering. So again, less risk for hypoglycemia. Uh, the patients where I do get a little bit nervous about, if they're already on insulin, I will dial back their insulin. If they're on an SU, I will dial back their SU by half and see how they respond. And I also am a lot more careful in the elderly uh, where side effects can be greater and have greater consequences. So, Julie, you're going to drop their SU dose, say they're on dimicron 60, you're going to make it 30? Is that right? Depends on their A1C. If we're in the lower range, as David Fitch had mentioned, I would do that. If they're in the higher range, I'd be a little less likely to. And if they're on 20 units of Lantus, what are you going to do? I'd probably drop it between 20 to 40 percent, depending on my feel of the patient. 20 to 40 percent. Okay, thank you. So, nice. David, um, I have a very busy clinical practice, and I don't want this to be, you know, a greater burden for our team. And I'd like to know, are there patients in whom I can start this drug safely and not have to see them again in four to six weeks. So if a patient has a blood pressure of over 110, good renal function, everything is under control with their heart failure, and this is really the only issue. Are there patients that it really can start the medication and really not have to worry about? Yes, I think there are. I think that I saw a patient like that this morning. Somebody who'd had a, a myocardial infarction came back to me for follow-up, A1C of 8%, blood pressure 140 over 80, uh, normal renal function. Uh, I started him on a, an SGLT2 inhibitor, and I told him he, was, he needed to come back and see me in four to six months, but he should follow up with his GP for uh, his, his glucose control, his diabetes care, but no specific need for earlier blood tests or uh, uh, early follow-up. Okay, thank you. And what about finally here, uh, what about a patient who's on multiple cardiac medications, a heart failure patient who's on multiple medications? Are there any drug interactions okay, that I need to worry about? Uh, so I think the most obvious one is other diuretic therapies. So uh, in other, in other uh, in patients with that normovolemic, normotensive state where we might want to back off on their loop diuretics, there's no, no data, no data or suggesting that you have to change a thiazide diuretic dose if they're already on one. There's very little, very little additive effect on blood pressure with a thiazide and a, an SGLT2. Um, around other antihypertensives, you would make changes just based on your acumen when adding another diuretic. So if a patient's hypotensive or relatively hypotensive, you'd have to use your judgment about backing off on non-essential other agents, such as, for example, a calcium channel blocker would be the first one to go for me usually, like their, 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 non, their uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker is usually the first one to go for me if they have lower blood pressure, and those medications can always be added back on top. In patients with impaired kidney function, I typically do not modify their, their RAS inhibitor, as an example, um, so I don't reduce their ACE or their ARB. And then for their other diuretics for heart failure around um, spironolactone um, or other mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, there's again no data to suggest that we have to modify these agents beyond what we would typically do in a patient with impaired kidney function or at risk for hyperkalemia. So there's no specific guidance around um, uh, dose reducing those therapies either. Yeah, so there are lots of other questions, but I want to give some time to your next set of questions. And then we'll come back to some audience questions about SGL2 again. So more, more practical considerations. This one on GLP1RAs. My obese patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has poorly controlled type 2 diabetes on metformin, cetagliptin, and canagliscalifloxin. Should the endocrinologist and I convince the patient to start insulin? That's a question for Julie. I guess I'm talking to myself because I'm the endocrinologist. Yes. <laughs> but um, so for a patient with uh, obesity, 
Uh, I don't know their level of A1C, but that would be uh, relevant in terms of starting insulin or not. Um, I'd probably move to the second question, and really the decision is, is if they're not at target, which is an A1C of 7% or less, depending on the patient, the question would become whether or not I start a GLP-1 receptor agonist over insulin. Uh, my feeling is if the patient's hemodynamically stable, has a normal EF, I would consider GLP-1 receptor agonist for targeting both body weight loss and for lowering A1C. So you'd start that over the insulin? Again, it's a conversation with the patient. There are third-party insurance uh, mm -hmm. questions. It's not universally covered yet under OHIP, so that would also be a factor. They would also have to ask about side effects and um, patient prefer preference. The ability, though, to control patient's blood sugar with once-weekly administration of uh, one of the once-weekly GLP-1 receptor agonists is quite favorable and very popular with my patients. Um, and again, I want to know whether or not there's a cardiovascular history with this patient. If there's clinical cardiovascular disease, then I would be favoring GLP-1 receptor agonists. And would you have to stop the citagliptin before you start it? Yeah, that's a great point that you bring up. So uh, citagliptin is a DPP-4 inhibitor, and that's working on endogenous levels of GLP-1. So if I'm going to initiate a GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is really pharmacological levels of GLP-1 receptor agonism, we can then stop the DPP-4 inhibitors. There's not going to be any additional benefit. It's only going to contribute to polypharmacy, and um, it's not going to have uh, any effect given the fact that we're starting a GLP-1 receptor agonist, and there's additional cost. And what about the canagliflozin? What would you do with that? So we still do not have uh, dedicated studies with uh, sort of mechanistic studies, rather, with canagliflozin or with an SGLT2 inhibitor and a GLP-1 receptor agonist. They have been, been combined in clinical studies showing uh, efficacy on A1C in body weight loss. Whether or not they would have salutary benefits on CVFX, uh, we're waiting to see. And uh, I would only think that based on the fact that they have differing mechanisms on cardiovascular protection, that the two together would be additive, if not uh, adding... Uh, double the effect. David? So this patient has heart failure. Um, so SGLT2 inhibitors, both canagliflozin, empagliflozin, and I think dapagliflozin, although we're waiting to see the, all the results, do reduce heart failure events, reduce heart failure admission, reduce presentation, present, the presentation to the uh, treating physician in heart failure. So I think it would be very reasonable to continue the canagliflozin. In contrast, uh, GLP-1 agonists have not been shown to reduce heart failure events, uh, a fairly neutral effect. Uh, uh, so I, I think that it would be a good idea to keep the canagliflozin going. Uh, we don't know what types of heart failure canagliflozin helped in the emperor egg outcome trial because we've got no echo data. So it, we think a substantial number of the patients would have had diastolic heart failure, but that's a, a guess. Mansour, questions from the audience? We have a very engaged audience. So um, several questions. Let's try and do them rapid fire. Uh, optimal timing for initiating an SGLT2 inhibitor. Wait for euvolemia or at time of heart failure diagnosis in a diabetic patient? David? Uh, so uh, ideally at the once the patient's stable. So uh, they should, they should, these agents should not be used during states of dynamic volume status change. Mm -hmm. So they're, sorry, should not be used in the setting of dynamic volume status changed, change. So in hospitalized patients should not be used. These are sick day medications according to the Canadian Diabetes Clinical Practice Guidelines and should be stopped in the setting of volume uh, re uh, related changes, hypotension, et cetera, hospitalization. So should wait for euvolemia and for patients to be in a steady state. So can I just add to that? I mean, I'm often asked, what about the patient that comes in with a myocardial infarction? Uh, should we start an SGLT2 inhibitor during that admission? Uh, in the EMPA-REG outcome trial, we did not include people who had had an acute coronary event within the pre preceding three months. I think it's reasonable to consider an SGLT2 inhibitor in a patient who has stable hemodynamics, a good blood pressure, and is otherwise well. It would not be unreasonable to initiate the drug whilst they're in hospital. But anybody, as David has pointed out, 
who has hemodynamic instability, has changing diuretic requirements, I wouldn't dream of starting it in those patients. And a uh, question I'm going to ask to Julie. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, EMPA or CANA? Hmm. It's a good question. I would uh, still continue to favor EMPA, uh, although both have cardiovascular protective effects. Just the side effect profile with uh, EMPA seems to be uh, a little less uh, troublesome as compared <coughs> to CANA at the present time. Do you want to elaborate? What side effects? So uh, again, the main side effect being an increase for pr uh, amputation noted with canagliflozin. We still do not have a defined mechanism whereby which uh, these drugs definitively uh, cause amputation. There are theoretical uh, possibilities, <coughs> uh, but nevertheless, in the absence of having that side effect observed with empagliflozin, I would uh, favor empagliflozin. Can I just ask something? Yes, please. So I, I think a lot of us have felt that way for a while, and what's going to be interesting to see is, um, a, a, in terms of concerns around amputation risk, I think that's going to be a story that evolves over time as credence comes out. So in the renal world, it'll be very interesting to see how, how uh, credence is perceived and what the side effect profile is, um, and it'll be interesting to see what the uptake is in the renal world, given that it's the only dedicated renal trial. So I think it's a story that's evolving over time. And this is a question for maybe all of you. Um, why does there not appear to be a dose response effect mm -hmm. to SGLT2 inhibitors? 10 versus 25 of AMPA, 100, you know, 300 CANA. What, what, what's your comments or thoughts there? Uh, so if it is a sodium effect, um, then there, there may simply be a sufficient natriuretic effect to trigger this, these, these reflexes at the level, level of the heart and the kidney to both induce a plasma volume contraction around heart failure benefit and also to trigger the TG feedback effects around uh, renal benefits and not necessarily requiring the higher 25 milligram dose of EMPA, 10 of, of DAPA, 300 of CANA. That may not necessarily be, uh, uh, not, not be necessary, although those doses do have probably more of a metabolic effect around glucose lowering, the effect on sodium and other um, energy-related pathways, hypoxia, et cetera, may be sufficient with the lower doses. What's also kind of interesting is that there are even studies in the setting of type 1 diabetes with empagliflozin using a, a half of a, uh, using a, an even smaller dose, so 2.5 milligrams, which was just reported in the EASE programs, which induced a physiological response, although albeit attenuated, on uh, blood pressure, on A1C, and weight. So it may simply be that we can use smaller doses of these therapies to better balance the risks and the benefits. And the cardiovascular and renal in type 2, this may simply be sufficient to trigger these, these non-glucose effects. Nadia, any burning questions you have? Uh, not for me. Is there any other, are there any other questions from the audience? So the panel has a question for all of you. By a show of hands, who's prescribed an SGLT2 inhibitor? Good. It's about yeah. half the audience. And who's prescribed or thought about or recommended a GLP-1 receptor agonist? About 10%. Mm. Well, with that, on behalf of all the panelists and the faculty, I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, and please, your, uh, your uh, CME credits, you'll get scanned as you go out the door. Please do your, um, your response to how the session was, the uh, evaluation forms, uh, so that it helps us design them in the future. Thank you very much. That was very interesting indeed. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. It was a pleasure. Yeah. That was a good day. So sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I have to give a talk to the DPs. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. No, no, no. Thanks for including me. Renal protection. Yeah.